And so sitting up tall with the spine long, the shoulders relaxed, the head balanced between the shoulders. The eyes closed or at a very soft, gentle gaze. And with each breath in, just feel that compassion washes over you like a wave washing over the sand. And just as some parts of that wave are drawn into the nooks and crannies between the grains of sand, allow yourself to be absorbed into the compassion and the compassion to be absorbed into you. until you're saturated with compassion. And just take this moment to imagine what that must feel like to be so completely absorbed, to be so saturated with compassion that everywhere you look and everything you see, everything you witness and everything you experience is bathed in the light of empathy and love, acceptance, and understanding. And placing the right hand on the heart, the left hand over the right, we'll lift our voices in one beautiful om. Take a nice breath in. the head toward the heart, acknowledging all that is, and draw the face back to center, release the hands. So good morning and welcome to everybody. So in our yin class this morning, um, the readings came from the way of the Bodhisattva, um, which is called the Bodhicharya Vatara. And a Bodhisattva is an individual who is on the path of awakening and has a deep, deep commitment to compassion. A bodhisattva is the experience of the Buddha nature coming to life within the self. And there are many bodhisattvas, and they're all considered children of the Buddha. And you and I and everyone we know has the potential to be a bodhisattva in this life. You just have to walk through life with a certain attitude. And it's not the attitude of, hey, I just arrived. (laughs) (laughs) I'm here. Everybody pay attention. No, no. It's a very soft and subtle attitude that is as brilliant and bright as 10,000 suns, but softer than silk. And it's the internal knowing of the power of compassion. And it's also this heartfelt longing, wish, intention, and an awakened, alivened activism that supports the healing of all beings, that supports every single being, human and non-human alike, um, that they awaken to peace and prosperity of the natural abundance that exists. And because that calling, that intention, that activism, because it flourishes in the fertility of the heart, it just grows like like one of those invasive species. <laughs> Maybe even more so. You can't help but just emanate that. That even just the thought of someone healing. Like take a moment and practice. Close your eyes. And visualize someone you love. Someone who brings a smile to your face. And visualize they're healed. They are healed. Visualize their joy, their happiness their peace, their acceptance. 
visualize their understanding that even though they are going to suffer in this life to some degree, that the suffering doesn't have to lead the way, and this lights up such a joy inside the heart. And now visualize someone that you like, you know, someone who's friendly to you, that you're friendly to, and with the same amount of enthusiasm, be joyful for their healing. May they heal. May they know. May they awaken. See their joy in your mind's eye. See their awakening. And allow yourself to rest peacefully as a result. And now visualize an enemy. Someone you don't like. Someone you consider harmful to you. And visualize them as a healed individual. A healed person. And allow yourself to be joyful for their healing. Allow yourself to want nothing more than for them to be healed, truly. And then see yourself as if you were looking into a mirror. And gazing into your own eyes. Recognize your own healing and allow that healing to bring you great joy. Great joy and great peace. See yourself as healed. See yourself happy, peaceful, and healed. And then flutter the eyes open. Now I can make you a couple of guarantees. The first one was easy. The second one was easy. The third one was challenging. And the fourth one was probably impossible. For most. Maybe not all. It's easier to forgive the person who you feel is your enemy and to wish them the utmost healing than it is to wish that for yourself. Because we go through this life with such, like this, this mental impression of not being worthy of awakening. The bodhi chitta. The chitta is the mind stuff, right? The chitta is the consciousness that flows through the mind. And bodhi is the awakening of the consciousness. So to have bodhi chitta is to awaken to the consciousness that you are worthy and so is every other being everywhere, without exception, no matter what they've done or haven't done, no matter what you've done or haven't done. That this state of awakening to our own healing is our birthright. And that as children of the Buddha, as children of Christ, as children of God, as children of goddess, as children of Shiva, as children of Durga, as children of the universe. This is what we're here for, is to awaken our inner consciousness to the power of its own healing. And if we don't want that for anyone else, or for someone else, particularly someone, then there's no way no way we can want it for ourselves. Because a healthy, harmonious, peaceful, spiritually awakened individual would not withhold that experience from anyone or anything. So the first thing that we need to do is to come down a couple of rungs and understand that we're working at our awakening but as long as we're willing to differentiate who deserves to heal and who doesn't, then we haven't quite gotten there yet. This bodhicitta, this knowing, is the knowing of the deserving nature of all beings everywhere. Is the knowing that we are one of those beings. And it is also the knowing that there's nothing greater. There's nothing greater that we can experience than healing. 
And that in fact, our life's work can be about that. It really can. Our life's work can be about supporting a greater healing. You could be a doctor, a nurse, a counselor. You know, you can have a career that has something to do with healing. But more importantly, the attitude of your life can be about healing. The attitude that you walk with every single day, every time you put one foot in front of the other, it can be about healing. And that's the most important career, is the way you live your life and the attitude that you bring to that aliveness. It's guaranteed, and so many of the great masters through time have said, have said this, and I'm paraphrasing all of them, is to say that when you yourself understand that you're in the process of healing and you adopt the attitude of that healing, which requires, it necessitates a release of violence, then all other beings everywhere are at peace in your presence. They seek peace in your presence. They seek understanding because they know they have permission to and they don't have to fear anything in your presence. So they just release and let go of whatever it is that's stopping them from experiencing this beautiful healing within themselves. <clears throat> and it's not some like, mystical superiority kind of a thing that we can play with each other. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what kind of a vessel do you want to be in this life? Do you want to be one where when you walk down the street, people cower because they're so afraid of even looking at you? That's a military takeover, you know? Have you read some of the histories of the world where people who have been under military takeover are afraid to walk on their own sidewalks in their own town that they grew up in. Instead, they go and they hide in bomb shelters and they hide in basements and they hide, they try to hide in plain sight. Is that the kind of person we want to be walking down the street, the one who imposes that on people? Or do we want to be different than that? Do we want to walk as the establishment of peace? And allow people to come out of their bomb shelters, out of their basements, and out of their attempting to hide in plain sight. And then walk with them in solidarity. We have meetings here at the ashram almost every Wednesday for staff. It's called the solidarity meeting. It's not called a staff meeting. It's called the solidarity meeting because we're walking this path in solidarity. We're walking this path together. And everybody needs to be heard. And everybody needs to have an opportunity to speak what they need to speak and to resolve what they can resolve as we walk this path communally. And that's the way that we need to walk through the world if we want to experience this greater awakening of the bodhicitta, of the consciousness, of the mind and the heart. And in order to do that, we need to put away some things. We need to put away harm and violence. We need to put away separation and stories of superiority. And we need to get really humble, so, so humble. We need to get so <laughs> humble that we will go into areas and territories that we can't even envision ourselves entering into. The realm of another person's suffering the area where people's skin is a little bit different than ours, and their lingo, their street language is a little bit different than ours, and their attitude is a little bit different than ours. We need to go there and serve, not go there and preach. Go there and serve. We need to go to places where people speak a completely different language and have completely different customs. And we don't need to go there and preach. We need to go there and serve. It's really interesting. <laughs> no offense to anyone. But in Christianity, there is a mindset of conversionism. And the thing that I love about yoga and about the, the larger teaching of Sanatana Dharma, of the eternal truth, is that conversionism is ill-minded. 
to try to cause someone to convert to your way of thinking is ill. It's an illness. Do not convert. Do not share teachings with those who are not interested in the teachings. Krishna to Arjuna and the Bhagavad Gita. Do not share the teachings with those who aren't interested. You're only going to cause them frustration and yourself frustration. And that means you're going to take a couple of steps backward into your own suffering. Well, I found this truth. How come nobody else wants to hear? Because what they want to hear and don't want to hear is like none of our business, unless they ask. And then if they ask, then have a conversation. But remember that they're not you, that they have their own upbringing, their own culture, their own practices. And just because they call themselves a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Zionist or you know, a Sufi, whatever they call themselves, it doesn't mean that what they're practicing is not as valid as what you're practicing as a spiritualist or as a yogi or as whatever you call yourself. It's just that they call it by a different name. That's all. And they're as hung up on certain points as you are uh, hung up on certain points. They're seeking clarity on certain teachings, just like you're seeking clarity on certain teachings. We're all seeking clarity, and we're all hung up to some degree. So don't preach to others and hope to convert them to your way of thinking. It doesn't work that way. Instead, be the path that you wish to inspire in others. Because, you know, Michelle teaches in a program that we do over here at the school. And it's a program that I wrote, like, a lot of years ago. I don't even know. Many years ago. And the first year that we had that program in, in the school, Ocean Academy in New Jersey, the teachers and the faculty and the, the staff all took part. They were all so gung-ho. And they listened, and they took the little papers, and they incorporated what, what we were doing with the students in their classrooms. And the students did so well. Reduction in, in uh, uh, missed days, um, improvement in test scores, which wasn't even something we were worried about. We just were looking at behavior. But their test scores improved, their attendance improved, their interest improved, their sense of safety improved. The number of times they were written up for episodes of outbreak, violence, whatever you want to call, decreased dramatically. The teachers had more cohesiveness between them. The teachers said they felt safer in their job. They saw a definite improvement in the students. Parents were saying they saw a difference in the kids at home. Year two, the program is so successful that they bump up the number of kids in the school because they only had like 40 then, or 35. They brought it to like 45. Ten kids who have uh, tier two and tier three behaviors is a big change in a school of like 35 kids. You know, you take on a couple of extra. Now there's an added <coughs> amount that's needed to be invested. Teachers were getting frustrated because there were other changes happening too. They didn't take part so much the second year, and we didn't see anywhere near the benefit that we saw the first year. We still saw a benefit, but it was not as widespread. Why? <coughs> because those who were preaching weren't practicing. We were practicing, but the teachers who were the academic teachers who were preaching to the students, you got to do this. Do your yoga. Do your meditation. But they're not doing it. And if they're not doing it, how does that infuse inspiration for anybody else to do it? Sure, we were doing it. But we were only there like two and a half hours twice a week. You know, The rest of the time, these kids have to see this constantly in order to be inspired to practice it constantly. And the academic teachers are the ones who are responsible for that. So don't you be one of those teachers walking through life thinking, I'm going to tell you what's going to fix you. Nope, don't tell anybody anything. Show through your own behavior, through
through your own awakening, through your own compassion, through your own dedication and discipline, show. Don't tell. Show. Lead the way through example. Because otherwise you're just a dictator. And notice that the first word of that is dick. (laughs) Don't be a dick. I couldn't help it. (laughs) It was just right there. You all know what I'm saying, right? That's why you're laughing, because you totally get that, right? So don't be one of those people. (laughs) What was that, Rich? (laughs) I apologize. Still, don't be one of those people who think that they have superiority. And all they have to do is tell you and you should do it. Uh, what was that? Spirit already. I thought you said spirit already. Oh, I thought you said spirit already. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. Maybe I'm not speaking loud. I apologize. Yeah. The attitude that we show up with. And that's what's talked about in here. And in chapter two, which I'll just read a couple of of uh, verses from. I find it to be so beautiful. There's another text called the Dhammapada, um, which is in Buddhism, one of my... I love all Buddhist texts, and I love all Hindu texts, and I, I love all texts, because they all show us so much, you know? And so it's really... It's, it's, a, it's a little challenging, because over at the college, they, they don't really know what to do with me. Like, they don't know how to address me, and I found this also when I started a program at Devorah Heart and Lung Center, um, an in-house yoga therapy program where I would go and sit with patients' bedside and teach them relaxation techniques and breathing techniques. And, and the nurses and the doctors didn't quite know what to do with me, so they would see me coming down the hall and they'd get busy writing in their, their, their charts or having a meeting real quick in a room or something. And I never forget this one day, this Dr. Eng... Um, he was a, a, a cardiothoracic surgeon at the hospital. And there was an elder gentleman. So before I read this, this is a good story. There's an elder gentleman who's a patient, and he's, he wants to leave. And he's having a, a bit of an episode, angry. And he's yelling at Dr. Eng, and he's yelling at the nurses and the staff, and he's like, I'm out of here. You people are doing nothing but keeping me here for billing purposes. I got to go. I can't stay. So, so Dr. Eng sees me walking down the hall. And now, mind you, this is like, a, I've been there for like a month, you know, and everybody's like too afraid to talk to me because they don't know what I'm going to say. He goes, Suda. And I'm like, me? <laughs> yes. He goes, quickly, come here. I need your support. I was like, okay. So I go down there, and he's got me in the hallway, and he says, this gentleman, he can't leave. We're afraid he's going to have another heart attack. But he's saying, he, is there anything you can do to talk him into staying one more night until we're ready to do this test tomorrow morning? It can't be done before then. So I said, certainly, I'll go talk to him. So I go in, and he goes, I don't want to talk to any more people. I said, I don't, I, you don't need to talk to me. I said, I just want to sit with you for a few moments and, and, and come to understand what's happening here. Because I apologize, but I don't have all the facts. Can you share with me what's happening? And can we sit down while you're sharing with me? And he, so he sat down, and his eyes filled up with tears. And he says, i got to go. I said, why? Do you understand that you're in a medical situation right now that's a bit dangerous if you leave here? He goes, my wife, she's at home. She's disabled. My son was supposed to check on her. He hasn't called me. I don't know what's going on. I need to go make sure she's okay. And I looked at him and I said, did you tell the nurse this? He goes, no, they don't want to hear this. And I thought, oh my gosh, where do you live? How far from the hospital are you? He goes, I'm right around the corner. I said, okay, if I have somebody on staff go over to your house and make sure your wife is okay and come back and report back to you, will you stay? He said, well, yeah. He said, but I need to know she's okay because she's my everything. She's everything to me. And he's crying at this point. 
So I said, okay, stay right where you are. Please don't get up, just stay here. Let me go make arrangements for this. So I went out and I looked at Dr. Ng and I said, did anybody ask him why he wants to leave? And he was like, I'm not sure. Communication, his wife. We need somebody from the hospital to immediately, right now, without hesitation, go to his house and make sure that his disabled wife is okay. So they did, and she was all right. And the son just hadn't called him, and the son was there with her. And he stayed, and he had the test the next morning. You have to listen. You have to ask. You have to be able to offer up everything that keeps you away from connection in order to have, to help, to support that connection so that other people can have the space they need to heal. So powerful. So in here, chapter 2, which is titled Confession, the author states, To the Buddhas, those thus gone, and to the sacred Dharma, spotless and supremely rare, and to the Buddha's offspring, oceans of good qualities, that I might gain this precious attitude, I make a perfect offering. I make the perfect offering. You make the perfect offering. I offer every fruit and flower, every kind of healing draft, and all the precious gems that the world contains, with all pure waters of refreshment, every mountain wrought with precious jewels, all sweet and lonely forest groves, the trees of paradise adorned with blossom, trees with branched, bowed with perfect fruit, the perfumed fragrance of divine and other realms, all incense, wishing trees and trees of gems, all crops that grow without the tiller's care, and every sumptuous object worthy of being offered. Lakes and mirrors adorned with lotuses, delightful with the sweet-voiced cries of water birds and everything unclaimed and free, extending to the margins of the boundless sky. I hold them all before my mind, and to the mighty sage, the greatest of our kind, and to his heirs I make the perfect offering. Sublime recipients, compassionate lords, O oh, think of me with love, accept these gifts of mine. For destitute of merit, I am very poor. I have no other wealth. And so, protectors, you whose wise intentions are for the good of others, in your great power, receive them for my sake. Whatever I see, whatever I do, wherever I walk, whatever my five senses become invested in, may that be the offering so that I can hold the space necessary for others to feel that they can heal. And that's the teaching of this text, of this scripture, and of every scripture ever written. May we slow down, become quiet, so that we can hear what's being communicated. And then may we hold space for whatever that communication is. Without that, our world won't heal. Without that, we won't heal. Without that, we can't fully support each other. So I, I suppose that my, my intention and my hope for you and for me and for all beings everywhere is that we find our way to that light and that we find our way to whatever that means for us because we each have a little bit of different work to do, a different way of holding space dependent upon what our karmas are in this life that we have to negotiate and resolve as part of our life path. May you know that, you know, and may you be brave and courageous in stepping up and needing that. And while the work we do in this life is hard, it is hard. It ain't easy. It is so challenging. While our work in life is so hard and so challenging, may we also step into that in a way that understands 
that the work that we do is going to flow out into this world and support this world in being a kinder, more generous space, the world we've created and co-created. And that'll give other people the same inspiration. It'll give other people the same opportunity. There's been too much neglect in the world. There's been too much of a lack of opportunity. We talk about lack of opportunity, like you know, job equality and access to jobs and access to health care. And these things are very valid and they're major concerns. But the primary opportunity of every human being and every being alive on this earth is the opportunity to heal. And once we come into a place of healing, then everything else becomes obvious. Everything else becomes obvious. To the person who thinks that they are their trauma, it's not obvious at all. Everything is defensive or offensive, one way or the other. But to the person who is healing and open to their healing and healed on some level, then nothing is defensive or offensive. Everything is exactly as it's meant to be. And then we see the obvious path to all of those equalities that we are so longing for and driven after. Obviously, you're going to take care of a child who's crying. Obviously, you're going to give health care to the person who's sick. Obviously, people deserve to be educated without having to go into crazy debt over it. The more people are educated, Nichiren Daishonin, which is another sect of Buddhism. How many of you know the Nichiren Daishonin Buddhism? Yeah, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Yeah, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Yeah. In Nichiren Daishonin Buddhism, one of the very first teachings of Nichiren is that only those who are educated in the ways of the Buddha, which is the Buddha heart, will have an understanding of what it is that's needed in the world. So truth and healing come through education. Not necessarily academic education, but it can be that too. Because think about it, you can't be a doctor without education, right? You can't be a nurse without education. You can't even be a spiritualist without education. You need to have education, be educated in something. Faith, practice, and study. That's it. Mm -hmm. the, three, the three big ones. Faith, practice, and study. FPS. Where's your hoops? <laughs> FPS. Faith, practice, and study. Yeah. So Nichiren and Daishonin Buddhism teaches that. Yoga teaches that. Tapas. Discipline. Absolutely. Yeah. The discipline to continue learning and to continue to be humble about the learning, to know that no matter how much you think you know, you don't know until you know you don't know. <laughs> and then you know. <laughs> That's fun. A little circular logic there. Yesterday I read a quote. It said, um, I got a little plaque uh, for my office over on campus. And it says, when we can treat every person as a father, as our father, as our mother, as our sister, as our brother, when we can look upon every person as our child, then we will understand what to do. And there won't be any more questions. That's from the Baha'i tradition. And it's a quote by Bala Ha. I can never say his name properly, but he's the founder of the Baha'i tradition. <clears throat> mm. Questions, thoughts, reflections for today. That was a lot, I know. Yeah. I'm doing very good time wise. I'm actually early. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there a differentiation between compassion and healing? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Between compassion and healing. I think there is a difference between the two, but they necessitate each other. You, you can't have healing without compassion, and you can't have compassion without healing. So 
the compassion is the path, the healing is the process. Yeah. The healing is the experience of the path, and the path itself is compassion. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a good question. Laura, did you have a? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, you said karma in there, and I just thought of how often karma is used like as a judgment. Sure. And so, like, oh, that person did this. No, that's not what and I so mean. I, by. And so I'm like, you know. Yeah. I just want to place that. Absolutely. Karma is so misunderstood. It's so misunderstood. <laughs> Man. It's endless. Like the interpretation and definition has been kind of like westernized or mm -hmm. anglicized. So much so. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Because when in, in the Western world, it's predominantly a Christian culture. Mm -hmm. And Christianity is based on the concept of sin and forgiveness. And therefore, and karma is action. And, and in Christianity, action is sinful. Or it's not, but most often it is. <laughs> huh? Depends on the action. Exactly. But, but in, the, in, in the Christian tradition, it does depend on the action. But when is action in Christianity, and I'm going back to my Catholic school years now, <laughs> when is action not sinful is when one is asking to be forgiven. So that sets in place this kind of idea that karma, interpreted in the West, is a system of mm, payback, um, is a system of um, the, the, I'm trying to think of the right word, it begins with an R, and I can't bring it out, somebody help me. Um, Retribution. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Lyme disease steals language every time that I, I it's right there, you know. Um, so, so I have chronic Lyme. I've had it for many, many years, and I'll always have it. And every once in a while, she's like, "I'm still here. Can't think of that word, huh?" Because <sighs> that's one of the things. Like the word is right on the tip of the tongue, but you can't quite pull it forward. So retribution. But what well, karma is action. You breathe in and out, it's karma. You blink your eyes, it's the karma. There's all different levels to karma. And the one thing that karma is not is a payback system. Because you're the one who's deciding. And in a state of ignorance, when we don't understand what action is, we think we own our action. And therefore, because we are the owner of the dog that bites, we're the one that has to tend to the dog. We're the one that has to tend to the action. We need to come into right relationship with our actions. But it's not a payback system. It's a resolution. It's that as we go through lifetimes, if you adhere to reincarnation, and even if you don't, as you go through moments in this life, um, the actions that we have committed that we feel stick to us on some psychological level because they were harmful, because they didn't allow us to shine, because they weren't authentic, whatever it is that we're attaching to that, then the attachment has to be resolved at some point. It's not so much that the, that the action has to be resolved as the attachment to the action has to be resolved. And in yoga, we call that, we think we're the doer, but we're not really. And there's a couple of levels to this. The first is that there are these three gunas in nature, sattva, rajas, and tamas. There's pathin, leth passion, lethargy, and balance. And these three, they don't always get along. Matter of fact, most times they're pretty much at friction with one another. And that friction is what drives this physical body to act. And that spirit, which is who you really are, is a witness of that action, not the cause of the action. That on one level, the sattva, the rajas, and the tamas, the three aspects of nature, are the cause of the action. But then you can take it to another level, and you can say that those three gunas, those three qualities of nature, they come from the mother, 
from the goddess, from the God. They're part of the universal consciousness. They're part of the divine. So if those three gunas are what cause this body to react and respond, whilst my spirit is simply witnessing those three gunas come from the divine. Therefore, God is the actor, not me. The divine is the actor. It's kind of a simple ex- explanation for something that's pretty complicated. That doesn't let people off the hook for poor behavior. Not in any way, shape, or form. As a matter of fact, that's where the yamas and the niyamas come in. That as an embodied being, my responsibility in this life is not just to heal It's also to resolve my attachments to the idea that I'm the one doing. And how do I resolve those attachments? I resolve those attachments through um, a dedication to nonviolence, non-stealing, truthfulness, non-grasping, economy of this body's energy, cleanliness, contentment, discipline, self-study, and devotion. Devotion to what? To the divine. And that by adhering to those ten principles, in the Shakta traditions there are um, uh, ten of each. In the Buddhist tradition there are often fifteen of each, yama and niyama. And in the yoga tradition there are five of each. They're all in the same realm with each other. By living a life that abides by those qualities. We are resolving our attachments. And then what ends up happening, and it's, it's a complicated process, but then through, through our awareness of these qualities and through our self-study particularly, which is looking at who I really am, who I think I am, who I am in light of the scripture that I study, in light of the texts that I study. And that's good for atheists too. Even people who don't believe in God, they study something. Maybe they read Byron. I don't know. You know, they, they, they look at something that is meaningful to them, right? Yeah. They, I don't know. They look at something that is meaningful to them and they, they, they understand themselves through those words. So then, because we're abiding in nonviolence and non stealing and non grasping and all these other beautiful, beautiful qualities, then the actions that this physical body is compelled toward is no longer governed by the, by the gunas as them being out of control. It's now guided by understanding that these gunas are often at friction with one another, but that these gunas originate in a higher energy, in a higher consciousness, not just the low consciousness or the earthly consciousness, but the materialized world consciousness, but also by this ultimate consciousness, which is not based in friction. It is actually based in peace. So be the peace of that higher consciousness. And then the gunas won't bother you and karma's resolved, no worries, because you won't have attachment anymore. What causes attachment is guilt. What causes attachment is anger. What causes attachment is I don't like that. I do like that. I want that. I don't want that. Preference. Preference. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah? Mm -hmm. The thing that I love about all spirituality and all religion, no matter what, which one it is you're talking about, because really at the crux of it, they're all the same, is that they all tell you the same path. They just use different words. And then what I appreciate about almost every religion and almost every spirituality, and I say almost because I'm still searching for the one that hasn't been corrupted, (laughs) is that they have all been corrupted. And they've all been corrupted away from their essential teaching to a place that causes you and me and many others to at some point in our life feel that we are not salvageable that we are not worthy, that we're not something or another. And God never said that. Christ never said that. No 
enlightened, awakened, universal aspect of God has ever said that. Ever. The only person who said that was a human. And those words are as flawed as the human. It's amazing. And I'll take other questions or reflections in a moment, but um, in the past few years, I've been looking gently at this um, religion called the Baha'i. How many of you know the Baha'i? Yeah. Oh, so beautiful. So beautiful. The Book of Certitudes. I just keep coming back to this, you know. It's like there's these three primary teachings on unity within the Baha'i tradition. And the first is that all of God is unified. The second is that all religion is unified. And the third is that all of humanity is unified. But we receive it in doses. So when we look at the specific teachings of Catholicism, the specific teachings of Judaism, the specific teachings of any religion on its own, we're receiving a spoonful of medicine and the bottle is on the counter. Because if you took the whole bottle of medicine, you might not be able to deal with it. (laughs) So you get a spoonful. And then you get another spoonful, and then another spoonful. And it's my opinion that we're very fortunate to have many lives because we get a different spoonful every life until eventually we finish the whole bottle. Then we have the answer. We're cured. That's it. We're done. (laughs) Thoughts, questions, or reflections? It's, it is a part of the Islamic tradition, um, originating in the Middle East. And in 1863, they were exiled. Um, interestingly, many Baha'i are artists and um, expressionists of some sort, musicians, this type of thing. And they were, they were crucified. Um, and so, and many were killed. And they left. There was an exodus out of the Middle East. And many went to India and to other areas of Europe. But many went to India because India is like the great everybody's welcome you know, country and uh, more region. And they went there. And the one thing that they're known for is that everywhere in the world where there has been a major settlement of the Baha'i, they have, they have built these lotus temples. And ha- ha- has anybody here seen a lotus temple? No, yeah. Have you been there? Oh. Which one did you go to? In my life, I think it's the end of the end of the It's amazing, right? So beautiful. I went to one in India. And I have this surreal picture. It's a lotus temple the size of a mountain. It's huge. And there's all these paths around it. And it was visiting day for schools. And all the schools in in this area, they all had uniforms on. And um, to me, it looked like something out of The Wizard of Oz. (laughs) Because thousands and thousands of school children are single file walking up to this temple. And the line is just so surrounding, you know, everywhere. And there's so much commotion outside of the lotus. Did you experience that when you went? There's so much commotion. Were you there on a busy day? It was no, it was um, like they were very closed off. Oh. Reason, but there was like people just coming to see it and kind of like take it in. Oh. But they were, there was a buzz, but it was like a humming. Yeah. Well, this day it was so busy. Like really there were so many. I mean like there had to be a million people there. And so we're, we're on this line, and we make our way to the temple. And outside, it's really, it's really loud. Like, there's a lot of people talking and celebrating and praying. And, and you get to the door, and you go in, and it's completely quiet. Mm. And you don't hear anything that's happening outside. Mm. And there's different levels inside of the lotus. Did you go in as well? Mm-hmm. Oh, there's different levels inside. Um, And the seating is, on the one level, kind of like um, stadium seating. It's round, you know. There's the benches that go round. So you can sit there, or you can go to the upper level. And the upper level is so silent. 
and the energy there, like I get goosebumps just remembering what it was like. You just sit and you're like, wow. And you know what's happening outside because that's where you came from. And now you're in the midst of what's happening inside. And it's so symbolic. Mm -hmm. It's so symbolic of attachment to the world and of spirit. Yeah, it's so beautiful. So they have, so the Baha'i, they have this, you know, God is unity, all religion is unity, and all humanity is unity. We just receive it in doses. And the doses are dependent on our attitude and our temperament in this life. Mm. Any other questions, thoughts, or reflections? Yes. The reading when you were uh, giving the yoga instruction, and, and um, the references to jewels and um, gems and cloth and fragrance and all these um, uh, you know, beautiful sensory experiences. Um, these things that we deem to have value because of their beauty, but that also represent great uh, wealth mm -hmm. and, and imbalance in the distribution of that. Absolutely. Um, when, and it's, it's not unique to any one religion nope. at all. How do we... Understand those those kind that kind of because it's symbolism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How do we make that mesh with you know the the inequity and, and and the lack of so many people that are also you're saying everyone's healing every everyone um, we have to stop looking at trauma and harm start looking at healing, but when we set our, this is, I'm sorry. That's okay, you're doing when great. When we set our, our, our sights on these kinds of image, images, and yet we know that what the, one of the things that the world needs as community, you know, are, are people who are being Detained are people uh, um, in Kashmir or in uh, Palestine? You know, who had all their freedoms and their, you know, even basic necessities taken away. Um, that I struggle then with this imagery of. Fine silks and gems and all that because I guess it brings to mind, you know, well, isn't that the kind of grasping at that kind of beauty causing so much separation? I love that you've asked that, and I love the process that you have brought your mind through in thinking about it and in contemplating its meaning. And so thank you. The first line is a flower, a piece of fruit, fresh water. And then he goes on for like 12 pages. <laughs> and he builds from there up to these other things that are man-made, mm -hmm. human-made, you know, fine silks, whatever. Columns. Yeah. Right. Temples, architecture, and jewelry, and gems. <clears throat> it's so interesting to me how... Um, How many of you would be satisfied putting 
a grain of rice on your altar only as an offering. Yeah? For a minute. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if a grain of rice is what you have, then that is what you offer. Why? Why do you offer what you have? Doesn't it belong to you? Like, so if you have a grain of rice, that's what you offer. If you have silks and a temple and gemstones, then that's what you offer. But why are you offering it? Doesn't it belong to you? Shouldn't you keep it and allow those those stratifications in society to become even more stratified so that the poor become poorer and, and the wealthy become wealthier? And isn't, isn't that, I mean, so why do you make the offering? It comes from God and it returns to God. Because it belongs to God. Nothing belongs to us. Nothing, Nothing belongs to us. Just you're, you're placing value of the, you're placing value in the rice which has no Right. Exactly. So let God have what belongs to God. These silks don't belong to us. These temples aren't ours. And you have more than a grain of rice. You have the gift of the Spirit. Right. You know, everything else is you know, just the smoke and mirrors. Yeah. But because we're in human form, we apply value to the smoke and mirrors. And because the teachings are corrupted, the fact that one person can offer a ruby and another person can offer a flower is looked at like, well, but so-and-so offered a ruby. But that's, the ruby never belonged to him to begin with. Never. And it never will. And so what these passages and similar passages in every text that has passages like this are calling to us to do is to remember that nothing belongs to me. Nothing belongs to me. And no one owes me anything. This is something that we teach in the YTT. Yeah? Say this 10,000 times. (laughs) Nothing belongs to me and no one owes me anything. And live your life by that mantra. Because that's what that's a calling to. It's saying what you have, you have a phone, put it on the altar. You have tea, put it on the altar. You have a house, put it on the altar. It doesn't belong to you. It's a transient thing. It's going to come, it's going to go. And you're happy in a moment when you have it. But if when it's taken away you're unhappy, now you know your issue. Now you know your attachment. And if you didn't use it while it was in your possession, which is not ownership, But if this tool did come to you and you didn't use it to inquire about unity, then it was, I would suggest, a misuse. And then it gets taken away because you didn't understand. Not taken away like because you're a bad child, but it goes away. The person who understands uses everything. Everything as an offering to the greater healing and the greater unity. And that can sound kind of flowery. Totally get it. But the reality is, you and I can live that reality. We can. Can we, can we cause you know, the leaders in other areas of the world, and, and this area of the world, to live by that reality? No. We cannot cause anybody. We cannot convert people to understanding that. We can only... We can only cause ourselves to understand. So when we read things like that, don't read it as to say that there's more value to the temple than there is to the fruit and the flower because the first thing that is said is the fruit and the flower. And they're in abundance everywhere. The last thing, lower down on the list are the things that we think are our personal objects that we own or something. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah. And then, you know, you you can't change the way people preach about that either. All you can do is make your own humble understanding 
And if you have a grain of rice, offer it. And if you have a million dollars, offer it. Utilize it for the betterment of, of, of all that is, not for the detriment. That's hard, though. It's hard because then we look at it and we say, but so-and-so isn't doing that. Why should I do it? Why should I? Because that's your dedication. Because that's who you are. You're not that other person. They're working with other stuff. One person is working with, with the trauma. And, and I also don't want to be misunderstood. I didn't, I, 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 they were not my words. And if they came out that way, I apologize. It's not what I meant. We need to look at trauma. We need to. We need to look and understand that they're suffering. We need to not close our eyes to, to that any longer. But we don't need to, to focus only on that. If we focus only on the fact that trauma exists, then we're going to be traumatized. We need to look at trauma, recognize where the trauma is coming from, and then commit ourselves to activism to change what we can change, to accept what we must accept, what we can't change, and to be wise enough to know the difference between the two. Isn't that a great, great parable poem? Yeah. So, so we need to see and recognize and acknowledge trauma. That's where compassion comes from. But we don't need to live there. What we need to stop investing in is violence and harm. So, and by that I mean our own actions. You know? Swami Shivananda was sitting with disciples one day, the story goes. He was sitting with disciples one day. And you know, in India, insect bites are a big deal because there's like malaria and stuff like that. So he had an attendee on each side of him. They were doing a, possibly a guru puja or something. I don't recall what, how, exactly how the story goes. But a mosquito, you know, TC, uh, malaria, lands on Swami Shivananda's arm. And the, the disciple goes to sweep it away. And Swami Shivananda said, no, leave it alone. She's feeding. She's got babies that are coming. And the disciple said, and you could get malaria. And he said, I won't get malaria. Just let her have what she needs. She'll go when she's done. I mean, raise of hands. How many would do that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. For a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a t-shirt for a minute. Yeah. Any other reflections or questions or thoughts? Tomas? I, I just was really moved by your process. Um, and it's interesting because the symbolic nature of beauty, right, um, or adoration, you know, the quality of adoration, you know, to me, it's just a really beautiful mechanism or uh, karma or action to or recognition, you know, to to better know God or to to be able to see God manifest, perhaps, you know, in that twelve pages, right? <laughs> that we all look at it from a little bit of a different angle, you know. So this speaks to the flower and the water, and then to the rubies and the silk, um, to be accessible for whatever state of human condition we're in, you know. The differentiation between a silk and a ruby being better than a flower and water is, you know, or that, that that's all social construct, or mm -hmm. that's all our human superiority, inferiority interjected in it, you know. But they're actually, <laughs> the only thing that's true is that they evoke within you a sense of adoration or devotion or beauty, you know, so they're actually completely equal. And they belong to God anyway. Yeah. So you're only giving back. You can nurture a flower, but it, it comes straight from mm. nature from God, or water flows freely. Mm. Silks and gems, you know, we've come to associate or to understand that uh, just like great temples, that comes on the, mm. the backs of Human labor and, and 
and injustice and, and that kind of yeah. uh, thing. But, but where do they come from? Yeah. And the artistry behind them is human. So, yes. But so where does that artistry come from? Corrupted. Perhaps we've become corrupted as, as our uh, species has kind of become complicated or, or refined <laughs> progress, right? <laughs> progress. But, yeah, but, but, but the, this speaks to that too. Do you understand? It's not just the flower on the water. It speaks to the level of consciousness that would identify beauty as such, right? So it's not leaving out the rich either. It's not leaving out the person who does, who's been acculturated to, to see beauty in silk and movies. So to, for, for that person to be able to offer their silk and rubies unto the divine consciousness is where they're at, you know? Okay. So yeah. the problem isn't with the silk and the rubies, you know, they're just... They're the same as the flower and the water. It's just the association that we have with it. And that in order for us to become equanimous with it, is that the word? <laughs> Very good. You know, that, that putting that on the altar is as equal as putting the flower and water, you know, on the grave. Or a smile. Or a smile. Mm. Yeah. Or love. Yeah. Or your sorrows, your traumas. Your faith. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's very important with what intention we put in this. Mm -hmm. Is this the best I can and the best I want to give you? Or uh, there are strings attached. Yeah. Are we negotiating? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we negotiating? Are we yes. like this for that? Mm -hmm. There's this story of the Buddha. Um, you'll probably remember this from SGI. But, uh, so the Buddha comes to a town and they're adorned. They're lavishing him with all buckets of grain and flowers and rubies and silks and everything. And there's this little boy who comes up to the Buddha with a mud pie. <laughs> and he offers the mud pie to the Buddha and the Buddha basically says, you know, take all that other stuff away. All I want is the mud pie because he gave all of his heart in that mud pie. Or you gave 10% of your silk or 10% of your rubies. Yeah. You know, that, that this, is, this is the only thing that has value. Because he gave it all, and, you know, it was given with love, without a sense of sacrifice. It was just given from his heart. Yeah. Like the little drummer boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. And he had had the trauma. Yeah. The song of it serving on the side of the road as the king passed away. Yeah. So it's into, you know, it's it's when you start thinking about it in that regard, it's like so. So what part of life is not an offering then? It, so you treat everything as an offering, all, all of it. Mm -hmm. you know, this conversation is an offering. You know, your, your service when you're volunteering is an offering. Your Hanuman Shalisa is an offering. Mm -hmm. Your breath in, your breath out is an offering. It's all an offering, and I don't want to keep any of it for myself. You don't keep any of it for yourself, because it doesn't belong to us anyway. You know, We're just traveling through this life, in this vehicle. And there's, there's a lot that we can take part in and experience. And there's a lot of harm that we can commit. There's also a lot of healing that we can support. It all depends upon our perspective and our attitude toward these things. Yeah. Any other thoughts, reflection? No. We're good. Let's sit up nice and tall and close the eyes. <clears throat> Take a nice breath in and a nice breath out. Inhaling and exhaling, being grateful for the breath.
With joy I celebrate the virtue that relieves all beings from the sorrows of the states of loss, exulting in the happy states enjoyed by those who are yet suffering. I revel in the stores of virtue, cause of gaining the enlightened state, and celebrate the freedom won by living beings from the round of pain. And in the Buddhahood of the protectors I delight, and in the grounds of realization of the Buddha's heirs. Their enlightened attitude, an ocean of great good, that seeks to place all beings in the state of bliss, and every action for the benefit of beings, such is my delight and my joy. <clears throat> Placing the right hand on the heart and the left hand over the right. And together we'll lift our voices in one beautiful Om and one All Beings Mantra. If you know the mantra, please join in. Take a nice breath in for Om. Om. Samasta Suki no Bavantu Loka Samasta Suki no Bavantu May all beings everywhere be happy and free. May the thoughts, words, and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all. Shanti, 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 Hari Om, Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha, Hari Om. Now and always honoring your light, the light of all beings everywhere. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. Namaste. Thank you all so much for being here today. So wonderful to gather and to converse with each and every one of you. Thank you for your reflections and for including yourself in this conversation. It's just such a beautiful path. Now. Yeah.